Recording in progress. All right, let me first uh, tell you that the process that I'm going to uh, employ, but we'll get the defendant out first. You may. All right, um, in regard to the two motions that we're dealing with uh, expert witnesses, let me tell you that my, my decision is as follows. I'm of the opinion that the information that is sought <clears throat> in this case by the state's expert witness is permissible under the rules. I know that the defense has, in good faith, operated on the assumption that these issues are not discoverable under the rules of, civil, of criminal procedure and the rules of evidence. However, as was pointed out in the uh, hearing yesterday, um, our Supreme Court has held that in a death penalty case, especially as to the sentencing, those rules are not to be strictly applied. That was the reason that we were able, in, uh, based on the Hester case yesterday, to employ the uh, four alternates to reserve them for possible use in the sentencing phase if there was an issue. In addition to that, I've reviewed the case that uh, Mr. Evans has cited, the uh, State versus Scheifelbein case, which is uh, what the uh, defense is relying upon about the notes not being provided. But I would also point out that in the State versus Eugene Hodges, Harry U Henry Eugene Hodges, our Supreme Court in a death penalty case, had, or the Court of Criminal Appeals rather, in a death penalty case had also provided that the trial court has the discretion <clears throat> to require that the underlying facts and data used by the experts to formulate the opinions to be provided to the other party, and that's under Rule 705 of the Tennessee Rules of Evidence. And that the court further stated that there's a general rule of trial court will require disclosure of the underlying data of the expert's opinion when the court believes that the party opponent will be unable to cross-examine effectively and the reason for such inability is that the, is other than the prejudicial nature of such facts or data. Um, it is my opinion that the information that I have previously ordered on multiple occasions to be provided to the state's expert is in compliance with the read uh, procedure that our Supreme Court adopted. The read procedure differs from the rules of criminal procedure. It is a specific procedure that our Supreme Court set out, whereby in death penalty cases where the, the defense intends to introduce mitigation expert involving testimony involving mental health issues, that they are required to give notice of that fact to the, to the state, and then the state has the election to uh, have their own mental health expert uh, witness. And in this case, uh, they are to, or in that case, they are to then cooperate and supply the state's expert with all necessary and reasonable information. It is this court's opinion, as it has been from the very beginning. And the hypothetical I pose to Mr. Evans is that if you're going to ask an expert to render an opinion, not giving him the full information upon which testing was done and so forth, would in fact be, uh, render his opinion to be meaningless. And I understand the defendant's position is that they don't think that uh, it's necessary for them to turn it over and it's not discoverable. Uh, this court is of the opinion that my, rule, my order is in fact enforceable under the rules of evidence as well as under the read procedures and therefore I'm ordering that the defense expert witnesses supply the information that Dr. Schott has requested if there are notes that are um, requested, I will allow you to provide those notes to me uh, to examine in camera because that is also something that the uh, 
shackle buying case uh, court indicate that it might be better for the court to re review some of those materials in camera and I'm, I, if the notes are the issue then I would do that but I would just simply point out that I think it was Dr. Watson that was uh, giving his opinion let me find it yeah. Dr. Watson gave his opinion um, and in it he rendered or he gave us a listing of all of the tests that were performed and I think the listing of tests that, that were performed uh, by Dr. Uh, Watson included two and a half pages of different tests and again to formulate his opinion obviously those tests would have been something that would necessarily have to uh, enter into his opinion or else there was no reason to perform those tests but more importantly that's the type of information that I believe uh, should be provided to Mr. Uh, Dr. Shot for the state and therefore my ruling is that the state's expert witness will be provided with all of that information if there's any information in the notes that they think is uh, something that shouldn't be provided then they'll need to submit that in camera for me to review and I will make my ruling accordingly based upon that um, I'm reserving the state's motion to exclude test the testimony of the defense mitigation expert witnesses until such time as I see that they have complied with the court's order if they fail to comply then they very well may be excluded from testifying if they comply then they will be allowed to testify Dr. Schott will be entitled to um, review that information and we'll have an evidentiary hearing before he testifies to determine whether or not his qualifications are such that would allow him to do so I will point out that Dr. Schott is entitled to testify uh, within his range of expertise regarding the issues that are in rebuttal to the mitigation experts of the, of the defense that is his purpose but there are certain things that that have been pointed out in his report for example that that may go to the issue of the accuracy of the testing and, and opinions of the mitigation experts um, that I'll not go into here but may come out during the hearing and it's not his report that's going to be introduced before the jury his report is just you know his uh, statement of what is involved and what he's uh, uh, arrived at an opinion but his testimony will be what's essential and that's where we'll have to have a jury out hearing to determine what his testimony will be so that's my ruling on those issues and we'll reserve the uh, anything further on those two until after we've gotten that information passed on but I will state that the information from the defense experts to Dr. Schott needs to be within the next 24 hours. So. And Judge, to clarify the ruling, does that include the raw data behind the testing? It does. Okay. Right. With that, then, we are ready to bring the jurors in. We'll bring in the four alternates first and then the other 12. So. And we're going to, as we discussed in Chambers, my understanding is the state will make its opening statement on the sentencing phase, but the defense is going to reserve their opening for a later time, and we'll make that explanation to the jury when they arrive. So. Good morning. We're going to bring the other 12 in before we get started. Thank you.
Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. Let me uh, explain to you that this will be the beginning of the sentencing phase of this trial. And <clears throat> in a sentencing phase, both sides have the right to make an opening statement to you about the issues that are going to be presented to you in this phase of the trial. The state will make its opening statement now. They will put on their proof first. The defense uh, will have the opportunity to put on their proof second. So I have allowed them to reserve their opening statement to make it to you after the state has rested their proof. So the state will make an opening statement, they'll present their proof, then the defense will have an opportunity uh, to make an opening statement and present proof as we go along. So it's going to reserve it. All right, General Crouch. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I want to, again, thank you for your patience. Uh, as we go through this process, as the judge said, this is the sentencing phase, and I would ask you as the jurors in this case to, again, uh, pay specific and close attention to the evidence and testimony of the witnesses. Uh, I will be very brief in this opening statement. The state intends to prove uh, five aggravating factors. Uh, those factors include, one, that the defendant was previously convicted of a felony whose statutory elements involve the use of violence to a person. Two, that the murder was especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel in that it involved torture or serious physical abuse beyond that necessary to produce death. Three, the murder was committed for the purpose of avoiding interfering with or preventing a lawful arrest or prosecution. Four, the murder was committed against a law enforcement officer engaged <clears throat> in the performance of his official duties and the defendant knew or reasonably should have known that the law enforcement was in fact engaged in his official duties. And five, uh, the defendant knowingly mutilated the body of Sergeant Daniel Baker. Thank you. All right. The defense has, as I explained, reserved their right to make their opening statement, so the state may call its first witness. Thank you. Your Honor, the state calls Dr. Feng Li. Dr. Feng Li. We're glad to have such an impressive podium, but it weighs about 300 pounds. So as you see these two strong young men trying to move it around, just understand that we've advocated trying to put it on wheels that might make it easier to do that. So. You would stand right here, face clerk, please. Do you solemnly swear, firm, that the testimony you give in this case be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth to so help you God? Yes, I do. Thank you. Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Uh, for the record, are you Dr. Feng Li? Yes. And Dr. Li, could you again um, say your name for the court reporter and spell it? Feng Li, F-E-N-G-L-I. And Dr. Li, how are you currently employed? I'm currently Chief Medical Examiner for Metropolitan Nashville and Davidson County. Okay. And Dr. Li, what are your, just briefly, what are your medical qualifications? Uh, I had a medical degree from China, uh, PhD from University of Louisville, and a law degree from National School of Law. I had my uh, residency training in anatomic and uh, clinical pathology in Philadelphia, forensic pathology fellowship training in Philadelphia. Okay, 
And at this point, Your Honor, we'd like to move what's been previously marked as trial exhibit number, I believe, 217, Dr. Lee's CV into evidence for this hearing. All right. For the sentencing hearing, Dr. Lee's CV will be marked as an exhibit for this hearing as well. Exhibit one for this hearing. Yes. It was exhibit 247 in the jury trial. The curriculum vitae? Oh, that one. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> And, Your Honor, at this time, we'd also like to tender Dr. Lee as an expert in forensic pathologist. All right. Let's just, for clarity's sake, let's just continue using the same exhibit numbers, and we'll just okay. show there are already exhibits to the trial. So what is the... Do you use the same number? Yeah. What is the exhibit number? 217? I believe it is 217, then. Okay. And, Your Honor, we'd like to tender Dr. Lee as an expert in forensic pathology. Any questions? Oh, All right, Dr. Lee will be um, qualified as an expert in forensic pathology. Right. And Dr. Lee, I'm going to approach and hand you what's been marked as Exhibit 247. Do you recognize what that is? Yes, this is a copy of my uh, autopsy report. Okay. And Doctor, you've previously testified about this autopsy report, but I'm going to go over a couple different questions with you again, okay? Okay. Um, now, Doctor, just briefly, uh, how many gunshot wounds were there to Sergeant Daniel Baker? Total six. Okay, thank you. And we have gone over those in great detail, and we're going to make this as the state's next exhibit, which I believe is actually going to be 247. And doctor, if you would please, is the document on the screen the same document that you have, the autopsy report? Yes. Okay. And in your autopsy report again, does it go over and uh, chronicle all six gunshot wounds with, along with other injuries? Yes. Okay. And if we could please focus down on, uh, I believe it's going to be page five. We're going to talk about the thermal injuries. Uh, Dr. Lee, could you again go over what the thermal injuries were to Sergeant Daniel Baker? So thermal injuries for late time basically is like a burn. And uh, there are several uh, classification or, you know, injuries associated with thermal injuries. First of all is the area, how big it is, and the second is how deep it is. Uh, for the depth of the Thermal injuries, usually there's a first degree, second degree, and third degree, sometimes even fourth degree. And for the areas, you would say the rule of nines or, you know, that type of thing. So rule of thumb is your one hand is about 1%. Okay, thank you, Doctor. And in this case, um, could you go over a little bit more about your finding of the carbon monoxide um, and soot in airways? Right. Carbon monoxide is a byproduct of the burn. And uh, when the, you know, especially these materials burn, any complete combustion of the material will generate these toxic fumes. Uh, carbon monoxide is one of them. And uh, soot is also will be a byproduct of the fire or burn. And in the enclosed area, if there's a meaningful breathing of this byproduct, especially carbon monoxide or salt, then they will be <coughs> deposited in the airways, including the trachea, bronchi, and so on. And the carbon monoxide level will be detected in the blood. And in this case, there's no soot in the airways, there's no carbon monoxide detected in the blood. Okay. So, doctor, does that mean, um, based on your medical experience and professional opinion, that at the time of the burning, that Sergeant Daniel Baker was already deceased? Right. Okay. Um, if we could, please, Mr. Etheridge, um, have the first image up. I'm going to hand you what's been marked as Exhibit 241. <laughs> And doctor, the image on the screen, is that the same image that you see? Yes. And can you describe this? Right, these are the brown discoloration and the black and brown areas. These are the burns on the skin 
and mainly on the right side of the torso and the buttock area. All right, thank you, Doctor. We'd move that photo as the next state's exhibit to the sibling group. Photo. Do you recognize that photo, Doctor? Yes. And, and what is this? The same, you know, the, the, the discoloration brown and black areas on the torso, right side of the torso and the right buttock area, these are the burn uh, on the skin. All right, thank you. And we would move that photo as the state's next exhibit. And doctor, do you recognize what that photo is? Right, these are the uniforms and the clothing uh, associated with the victim, and uh, they are partially burned. Okay, can we move that as the next, sex, next state's exhibit, please? And I'm handing you what's been marked as 244. And do you recognize those photos? Yes, on the other side of the clothing, right. and uh, they are partially burned. And your Honor, we would move that as the next state's exhibit. Dr. Lee, in this case, we discussed previously when you testified. Have you gotten a chance to review the body camera footage in this case? Yes, I did. Okay. And in the body camera footage, um, do you recall seeing multiple um, series of gunshots? Yes. Um, and in that, after the first round of gunshot fire, did it appear that Daniel Baker was still alive? Yes. And how do you know that he was still alive? Because he screamed, and uh, later he moaned, and he had a sound of breathing. Okay. Now, doctor, you said that he, he ran. Did you see him upright in the video? Yes. He uh, well, ran first and then collapsed. And after he collapsed and he was on the ground, did he appear to be breathing? Still moving and uh, still breathing and uh, some uh, noise on that. And after the last series of shots, um, which may have been to his head, um, is there still potential that he would have been alive? Actually, you know, when I examined the video, and I still can hear some noise associated with probably breathing after all the shots fired, and for a short period of time afterwards. And, and doctor, based on your other testimony, the first, the shots to Sergeant Daniel Baker's flank, would they have been, um, severe and fatal shots. Yes. So there's potential that he could have died just from those shots. Yes. And all of the extra shots as well. Yes. We'll pass the witness on. No questions. Thank you, Dr. Lee. You may step down and we'll release you from your subpoena. The state may call your next witness. Your Honor, the state will call Assistant District Attorney Jessica Borg. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you give in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, Jessica? Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. If you would state your name and spell it for the court, please. Yes, Jessica Bourne, J E S S I C A B O R N E. Ms. Bourne, what do you do for a living? I'm an assistant district attorney for the 21st Judicial District, um, which includes um, Williamson, Lewis, Hickman, and Perry County. And how long have you been with that office? I've been with the office since 2009. Since 2009, what sort of courts have you practiced in? I've practiced in General Sessions Court and Circuit Court. Um, since 2011, I uh, have been working domestic violence cases um, in the General Sessions Court as well as Circuit Court up until about three years ago where I primarily practiced in our circuit court um, doing uh, felony domestic violence cases and light cases as well as other general cases. Thank you. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? You may. <clears throat> Ms. Bourne, do you recognize that document? Yes, I do. What is that document? This document is a judgment out of our circuit criminal court in Williamson County. Um, 
again, uh, regarding the defendant, um, Stephen Wiggins, um, where he was convicted of aggravated assault in December 15th of 2017. Was he convicted as he was charged? Of this count, yes. All right. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? You may. Your Honor, we'll make the uh, certified copy of the conviction the next exhibit to this hearing. All right. Welcome to the next exhibit. Now, General Bourne, if you would uh, turn to the section of this. Well, first off, do you recognize the document that you have? Yes, this is a transcript of the of the plea. And this is the plea for which uh, we entered this last exhibit? Correct, for the aggravated assault on December 15th of 2017. Did you handle this case? I did. If you would turn to, uh, the, uh, I guess, the recitation of facts in this transcript, which I believe is on page 29, in particular for this count. Mr. Wyatt, hold on just a second. Let's get straight on our exhibit numbers because some of these, these are new documents that have not yet been exhibited. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a number of exhibits. What we're trying to do is to make sure we have them in, sequence, in the correct order. Uh, since these were made exhibits, we're keeping the original exhibits in their order that they are offered. Uh, but do we need to uh, offer them as an exhibit for this? Let's just mark them as the next numerical exhibit for the entire trial, which would be what? 248. 248 would be the exhibit number for those of you in the jury who are keeping up with them. 248 would be the collective exhibit of the charge of the uh, judgment form that was shown. All right, so this is now the transcript, correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right, I apologize for interrupting. General Bourne, it looks like on page 29, beginning at line 11, uh, does that appear to be a recitation of facts for this conviction? Yes, sir. And is this you speaking? It is. If you would, General, please read the recitation of facts as it pertains only to this conviction. So starting at line 11, moving on to case ending in 385, the summary of the state's proof would be that on July 6th of 2016, Dixon County Sheriff's officers, as well as Fairview police officers, responded to the Fairview Inn located here in Williamson County, Tennessee, excuse me, Williamson County, Tennessee, on a call for the defendant, Stephen Wiggins, holding a female, the victim in this case, Tiffany Beach, at knife point in a room at the Fairview Inn. Officers were able to gain entry into the room at the Fairview Inn where they did see the defendant holding a knife and the victim in this case, Tiffany Beach, was cornered in the hotel room. She was clearly in distress and in fear of imminent bodily injury. And that would essentially be a summary of the state's proof ending in case 35, or 385. Thank you, General. Uh, if we could, Your Honor, make the transcript the next exhibit. Right, transcript would be marked Exhibit 249. General Bourne, do you remember this case? I absolutely remember this case. Why do you say that? I will carry the... You may. You want this on the record? Yes. Portions of the transcript that only relate to this particular document. Right. Uh, to that transcript or to the redactions to the transcript. Okay. All right. You may proceed. May I continue, Your Honor? You may. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So how do you remember this case? Yes. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, step across the hall, if you will, please. The floor will wait just a moment for conversion. Just reminding you that we have to keep you separated from the other four since that, so that there's no communication between you.
Right. Mr. Evans, what is the basis for your objection? Our recollection of this case isn't relevant to the aggravating factor that established the aggravating factor. Her perceptions, her recollections, or otherwise are absolutely irrelevant. I don't know what. In the absence of the jury, would you ask the question of this witness and let me hear her answer so that I can determine whether or not they would be admissible? Yes, Your Honor. Why do you remember this particular case? I remember this particular case because Mr. Wiggins was in our jail for 13 months while we searched for the victim in this case, Tiffany Beach. We had our investigators searching for her that entire time in hopes that we'd find her and be able to pursue fullest extent of prosecution in this case because we were aware of Mr. Wiggins' history. We were aware of his history of violence. We'd worked with Dixon officers and established that. And it's every prosecutor's worst nightmare when you can't produce a victim that you have to have in order to proceed on a case to trial. We have to follow the rules of evidence, follow the law. And after 13, 15 months, we resolved the case on a plea agreement. And it's your worst nightmare when less than five months later, someone's released from jail and, in this case, murdered Sergeant Baker. I'll carry it with me my entire life. That's it, Your Honor. Mr. Evans? Your Honor, he's confined to an aggravating circumstance as part of this case in aggravation. The aggravating circumstance specifically states that the defendant was previously convicted of one or more felonies other than the present charge and statutory elements involved in use of violence to the person. They've proven that. They did that through the judgment, through the factual recitation. It was entered into evidence. Her perception of how this stuck with her is inflammatory, is unduly prejudicial. It's also not logically relevant. It has nothing to do with whether or not he was convicted of that crime. They've proven that. And to allow this before the jury would be— You know what? Let me hear from you. Mr. Evans correctly points out that the convictions or what is the conviction for a violent felony is what is the aggravating factor. And while certainly Ms. Bourne has the opportunity and certainly has every right to have her opinions about the situation, it would appear to me that her beliefs and the background she gives to the situation would go far beyond establishing the aggravating factor of a prior violent felony. Do you have some reason why that would be admissible? Your Honor, in TCA 3913-204, in Part C, the statute states that the state or the defense may put on evidence concerning the circumstances of the facts and the defense may have a chance to rebut. And that's simply what we're putting that in under that. The facts? The circumstances and the facts? Yes. Of the case, and you're talking about the aggravating factor of a prior violent felony. Correct. And it pertains only to that particular aggravator. Well, I think the circumstances and the facts have to do with what was testified to by District Attorney Bourne about the circumstances that occurred and what the soliloquy was about the events that led to the conviction, the factual basis for the conviction. Those are the facts and the circumstances. The information that she has now offered that goes beyond that and talks about and it describes her consideration of what happened after he was released from jail and so forth. And I know that every prosecutor's fear is that that sort of thing happens, but my concern is that that goes far beyond the facts and circumstances. The issue is to prove the prior violent felony, and that has been proven. The facts and circumstances were elicited in the statement that she gave and that she read from the transcript. And unfortunately, I'm afraid that going beyond that may create an issue that we're trying to avoid. So I'll have to sustain the defense's motion of objection, rather. General, I know it's how you feel, but I'm of the opinion that we are not going to be able to allow you to state that in the presence of the jury. Yes, sir. All right. Then we'll bring the jury back.
Ladies and gentlemen, as I told you uh, all along, there are times when I have to make certain determinations about the admissibility of certain evidence, and uh, I have considered the question that was asked by the, the uh, state and the objection, and I've ruled that, that meeting the aggravating factor standard uh, that the evidence that's been introduced through this witness is sufficient, and it's, I've therefore excluded anything beyond that. So, uh, Mr. Wyatt. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, General Bourne, last thing. Do you recognize uh, Mr. Wiggins here in the courtroom today? Yes. If you would describe what he's wearing, please. Yes, he's seated over um, at the table to the left with a blue button-up shirt on, glasses, dark facial hair. Thank you. Let the re record reflect that she's identified right. Mr. Wiggins. Record will so reflect. Pass the witness, Your Honor. Thank you. Cross-examination? No question. Thank you, General Warren. We will release you from your subpoena. You may stay or you may go. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Statement, call your next witness. Thank you, Mr. Nathan. Swear from testimony you give in this case, be the truth, the whole truth, not the truth, self Yes, ma'am, I do. Judge, may we approach? You may. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this next witness is going to take a little bit of time. You may remember, I think he was on the stand for about two days the first go round. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and break your lunches here. So we're going to go ahead and break for lunch, and then we'll come back as soon as lunch is over. We will be in uh, recess for lunch. All right. Stand up. How long is it? Do we anticipate it will take for lunch? Well, under the circumstances with the statements that we've made and the discussions that we've had regarding the uh, proof that we're going to be offering today, uh, let's just take an hour for lunch today. So we'll be in recess until 1 o'clock. <laughs>